This is back to back. Yo, what's up, back to backers? This is Willie Joy. Welcome to the show. I don't know why I said that like a used car salesman, but hey, how you guys doing? What's going on? How was your weekend? You feeling good? You feeling great? All right, good. Today on the show, my good friend Nick Catchdubs is my guest. I've been wanting to have Nick on forever. One of my favorite people, the co-founder of Fool's Gold Records, along with A-Track. A couple of years ago, he put out his first full-length album of his own called Smoke Machine, which was a really fun album. Since then, there's been a few singles. And this year, he's back behind the boards working with the rap group B.I.C. He's producing their entire album, which is going to come out in 2018. But the first single from that record called Drippin' Sauce is out right now. Nick also shot, edited, and directed the video for the song. I'm going to put the links to where you can find all of this in the description of this episode. Just by hearing that, I think you already get the idea that Nick is an endlessly creative dude. His mind goes a mile a minute. He's one of my favorite people to talk to. We're going to get into that in just a minute. Before we do, let's read some email real quick. Today's email comes from Sammy, and he says, I truly appreciate your podcast and the contribution to the music industry that you're providing. And then he says a bunch more nice things. Thank you. And this is interesting. He says, how do you feel about the aspiring and ambitious producers like myself using humor and personality to help sell themselves as an artist? I'm a pretty outgoing and funny guy, and I want to incorporate that in my brand. I've seen success with ideas like this from guys like Dylan Francis and Getter and how they bring their comedic side to kind of help sell themselves. Do you think this kind of thing could help me grow my brand and draw more people to me as an artist? I thought this was a really interesting question. If you've listened to this show before, you've probably heard me talk about uh, gimmicks. And honestly, I have no problem with it as long as it's presented in the right way. You know, in the modern era, I think people want personality more than anything else. I think that's what attracts people. With the rise in popularity of, of YouTube and vlogging and all of that, I think it's more relevant than ever. And you listed people like Dylan Francis and Getter, and undeniably, you know, their presence on social media has absolutely brought more people into their world. But on the other hand, their music is also really fucking good. They're some of the best producers out there. And, you know, I get a little concerned when you're talking about your brand right off the top like that, because that makes me worry that you're trying to be too calculated too early on. I would say stop worrying about your brand as much and just worry about having fun and doing things that you find exciting and entertaining. Because if you're doing that and other people see you being authentic, doing something you enjoy, that's really what attracts people. So, you know, there are absolutely right ways to do it. There are also wrong ways to do it. Basically, it comes down to a question of balance. You don't want to spend so much time putting your personality out on social media that you forget or don't have time to put your personality into the music or have enough time to focus on the music. Don't become the comedian who all of a sudden wants to make music. Be the musician who people like even more because he's a funny guy. If you've got a great personality, if you're outgoing, that will absolutely help you. But just be careful of how you're being perceived. Don't let it get away from you and make sure to focus on what's important. I think that's really it, man. And he sent me one of his tunes in the email. It's pretty dope. So I think he's well on his way. If you have a question for me, if you think I'm wrong, if you hate all the gimmicks in dance music, you think it's too much that's taking away, I want to hear from you. If you want to ask me a question about your own career, something you've been thinking about, really anything, let me know who else you want to hear from as a guest on this show. Email me at backtobackpod at gmail.com or you can hit me up on social media, at Willie Joy is the name, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, all of that shit. Holler at your joy. 
And hey, don't forget to subscribe to this show as well. Just click the subscribe button on whatever app you're using or follow the back-to-back account if you're listening on SoundCloud. Leave us a rating and a review in iTunes. I know I'm like a broken record with that, but it really does help and it's free and it's easy to do. And I read every one of those reviews myself. It means a lot to me, so I appreciate all y'all writing in. Last bit of business, I am still traveling overseas right now, so I recorded this intro a little bit early. If anything crazy happened in the world in the last couple weeks, I don't know about it. That's why I'm not talking about it. Right now, my access to Wi-Fi is probably not great. So I wanted to get this all out before I left. That's my little disclaimer. All right, so let's get into this episode with Nick Catchdubs. We recorded this at Atrac's house where Nick was staying in LA for a couple weeks. He had come over there because Fool's Gold was celebrating their 10-year anniversary with a booth and a show at Complex Con. Fool's Gold is 10 years old, which is crazy for me to think about. It makes me feel so old because I knew Nick and A-Track when they started the label 10 years ago. And since then, it's become such a mainstay not only in electronic music, but just in the music industry in general. I think people forget, especially in the early days, Fool's Gold introduced the world to so many artists. Kid Sister, The Cool Kids, Kid Cudi, Danny Brown. Even the first Run the Jewels projects were through Fool's Gold, and so many more. The discography is crazy. So shout out to Fool's Gold for hitting 10 years. That's a huge accomplishment for any independent label. And I think a lot of that success really does come down to Nick. Nick just never stops creating. And we talk about that a lot on the show, kind of his boundless enthusiasm just for creative energy and new ideas. You know, from running an extremely influential indie label for the last 10 years to putting out his own album and tons of singles to producing for lots of other people like the BIC project I mentioned earlier and many others and now getting into video directing and editing you know more so than a lot of people I talk to on this show Nick is really a renaissance man he's doing it all and he's doing it his way all through his lens Nick and I go way back we've slept on each other's couches We've played a lot of shows together. Fool's Gold released one of my early singles called Geeks. He's affected my life in a bunch of other ways. We talk about it in this conversation. And like I said, man, he's just one of my favorite people. Let's just get into the show right now. This is me and Nick Catchdubs back to back. Let's go. Yeah, I mean, it's worth talking about. We're out here in L.A. We're at uh, Casa de Atrac, his beautiful home. And you're a New York guy. It seems to me sort of when you guys started Fool's Gold, you know, 10 years ago, that New York was just the the vital heart of, of this culture, whatever you want to call it, dance music culture, hipster, hip hop, whatever it was. It was a melting pot at that time. To me, it seems like at that time, New York was just the heart of it. Everything was going on there. And then as the years went by, a lot of that has transitioned over to L.A. And it seems now that, especially for electronic music, L.A. has become this this heart. And I guess I don't know what is going on in New York anymore. I feel much more disconnected from it. Yeah. Also, too, I think, you know, it, it can't be overstated that the 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 scene is less about kind of individual parties and and nights and more about like I am a touring artist and yeah. at this night you know hello cleveland <laughs> that I, that that that's sort of you know the best way to sum it up i think that the north american electronic music scene of the last decade or so definitely started off as a more, you know, oh, I'll come to your house and sleep on your couch and yep. play your Thursday night electro sesh. You're literally <laughs> describing how we met. Exactly. And 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 so a lot of people they began their foray into this world as 
you know, the resident DJ at this party, the host of this party, the person who did the graphic design for this party. Right. You know, everybody found their little footing in. And I think that people do look fondly back on, you know, the innocence of those times in the same way that people in their 30s look back on their 20s. You sure. know, like all this stuff is 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 cyclical. And, and I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, you see something that maybe is a little bit more grassroots, a little bit more DIY, if only for the fact that not everyone can go from bedroom to main stage with the sort of uh, velocity that they have, um, you know, even, even, you know, two or three years ago. Yeah. What, do you see that happening in New York at all? I, I don't really, like, what's going on in New York? I do, I do see, you know, the stuff that happens in New York, it's either super big and corporate or it's super underground. Even like the sort of stuff where it's kind of like festival sized artist performing on a Friday or Saturday night. That's certainly not the thing that I go to unless right. it's like my actual friend and this is the only time I'm going to get to see them. Yeah. You know, th- there's not really um, I don't really have an interest in that. And I and I can kind of see like the interest of the public sort of waning as well. But there's always like some weird thing happening in like Ridgewood or something or like all the, you know, sort of parties and 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 little micro things that the ghetto gothic sort of world has uh generated there's not anything that i think is sort of like this is the sound of new york right now it's it's very um you know it's it's very splintered but it's been interesting to come into this sort of like your deep la immersion (laughs) for for the last two weeks um because people just fucking kick it out here you know, people like like there's a lot of hanging out. It's a very different vibe. And I think that when you apply that towards music or just like career based things, you can kind of see how that happens. Like, oh, yeah, we were just hanging out and we made this thing or we were just hanging out and now we go on tour together. Right. You in, know, in New York, you can't really just hang out. You can't. You have to schedule it. And it's very much like, you know, here people like, oh, we're going to the studio. Come meet us at the studio. Like everybody I talked to is like, oh yeah, I just started this complex in Burbank. It's like, oh really? <laughs> like in, in New York, everybody, you know, sort of like, I'm going to leave my cave to go to your cave. Right. And vice versa. You're going to make the the trek. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so long story short, I don't think that there's any one thing that's sort of necessarily like emblematic of New York 2017, which is good because I think that when no one knows what's going on, it's a fertile time for like some surprising shit yeah, to happen. Yeah, 100%. You know, when when um, things seem like they're a little bit stale or like, you know, oh, I don't really know what's happening. I don't really know what's, what's up. It, it's sort of like, oh, shit, that's great. Everybody sort of has their guard down. And, you know, the, the usefulness of sort of hopping from trend to trend has has passed yeah. and you know it's not just sort of like oh well this song is popular here's my twerk remix <laughs> and it's like oh shit you know and weirdly as much as that kind of stuff was fueled by soundcloud it was almost you know ex- extinguished by the fact that soundcloud is on on the wane right yeah i mean it's it's an interesting thing and i've been talking about that a lot on this show with different people is that you know SoundCloud dying or whatever you want to call it, it has eliminated the option for all of these gray area bootleg remixes to kind of make somebody's career, you know, just because it was such an easily available outlet. And so I think it's forcing young producers to come up with other ways to make some noise and get some eyeballs on them. Exactly. And, you know, and, and that doesn't, mean like making original music you know what i mean right, i think right, it's, yeah. it's it's this sort of larger thing i think success in the sort of like professional electronic world is is you know m- having good music's a part of it you know obviously you know you you and i as as people with you know morals and ethics and taste <laughs> you might think that it's a more important part than others but you know you you have to be very clear-eyed with looking at this stuff and it's not about it's not about your personal taste it's not about your personal perspective and outlook on things you know you you can't fight this stuff you can choose what level you wish to engage sure you know and i i I, even for me personally like i i have to sort of like you know recalibrate like sort of what level am i comfortable engaging like when i sit down to make music if i have this 
a thought in my head that's like, if I do something like this, my name will be a bigger font size on this right, flyer one day. Right. Like that's so fucked. Like it's it's the most backwards <laughs> way of thinking. But it's but it's really easy. It's really to catch easy, yourself. and it's something that I know for a fact. Lots of people do. You know, consciously they make the other choice. They choose to make the choice that will make their name bigger. Yeah. You know, and I and not to put a value judgment on that. I mean, it's uh, some people just to take a very sort of practical look at it, you know? It's one thing to be doing that at 18. It's another thing to be doing that at 28. It's another thing to be doing that at 38. You know what (laughs) I mean? Like, I think that there's so much shit out there that you might as well please yourself. Sure. Like, it's it's so hard to kind of cut through the, the volume of material you know, there's there's more artists than there will ever be stages. There's more records than any of us will ever have time to listen to. Even by, like, established motherfuckers. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, this week, the Young Thug and Future album right. dropped. Then the uh, 21 Savage, uh, Metro, Metro Boomin, Boomin. Uh, Offset album dropped. I was like, damn, I don't have time to listen to all this music. Right. Like, I want to. I like all of these people. Yeah. But if you can't even make time to listen to all the music you want to listen to, why are you going to listen to, like, DJ Who Gives a Fuck, yeah. you know? And <laughs> like, oh, check out my Bodak Yellow re- reflip. Right. I mean, I'm almost more forgiving of the old head dudes who kind of just keep the ball rolling and make the smart, quote unquote, decision than I am of a young kid doing it to get some clout, you know, at the start of their career. Because for me, the young kid, it's an open field, right? They could do anything they want. They have plenty of time in front of them to make a career. It, to me, it seems like that's the safest and probably the most fun time to just be creative and do something new and try new ideas. Whereas I guess I am more forgiving of, of an older guy with an established career who chooses to put in the the Lex Luger sound pack on his Sure. I, shit, you, know you know what, though? I think that there's a real difference between being crafty and, and sort of like taking an objective sort of like strategic. There's a, there's a big difference between being strategic and being cynical. Sure. You know what I mean? And I think that you can hear the difference. Yeah, you're right. And that's, and you know, that's, that's important because I think it's, it's easy to become cynical and make the decisions, especially in, in, in electronic production, because it's sort of like, you know, some shit pops off and you can go on YouTube and there's like a Russian teenager telling you how to, you know, re-engineer that baseline. Yeah. (laughs) Well, let's take it back a little before we were cynical, uh, you know, multi-decade producers growing up. You're from New Jersey originally, right? Elizabeth, New Jersey. What is, what is Elizabeth, New Jersey? What happens there? Might be the biggest, if if not one of the biggest um, urban cities in New York. Uh, I went to public school there. Oh, excuse me, New Jersey. Right. Growing up, it was cool because you were surrounded by a little bit of everything. And so even like music-wise, right, it was the peak of MTV yeah. and the box. And, you know, so on one hand, you have that and you have you have all of this kind of like fertile early 90s musical shit that was happening and then even just weird stuff that you would hear on, you know, the school bus. Right. Like the first time I knew that house music was a thing, it was kids like beating the back of the bus seat. It's time for the percolator. Wow. It's time for the per- – and I was like, what the hell are they doing? We just knew them as chants. Wow. You know what I mean? There was like this this Out Here Brothers song, uh, Pass the Toilet oh, Paper. Yeah. One of my pass favorites. Pass the Toilet Paper. We were like, oh, yeah, the Toilet Paper song. Um, That's like, like weird Spanish shit like – Cafe How con these- leche. <laughs> Cafe con leche. How are these kids even hearing this music? Like at older that time? brothers and sisters. Yeah. You know, because it wasn't really crossing over. Although I do vividly remember a girl having a witch doctor cassette single Ooh. at a party once. And I was like, yo, this song's cool. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, you know, you don't even know what that is. I didn't know what, what freestyle music was until I was an adult. I called it hairdresser music. Right. Because I would go with my mom to, to the hairdresser <laughs> and they would be playing that shit. And I was like, I was like, oh yeah, this is cool. You know, like hairdresser music. And were de- you always I, I think you're one of the the most broadly knowledgeable uh, music people that I know. Did you always have those kind of tastes, always just sort of absorbing everything around yes, you? Very, very spongy. And that and that doesn't mean I like everything, but I I I'm interested but you know about in it. everything. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so, you know, when I was in when I was in high school and then when I was in college, I, I played a lot of like guitar music 
and was was into the idea of like, oh yeah, let me start a band, let me do this. And it never it never quite panned out. It was never like the right combination of of humans. I was busy doing other shit, like you go, <laughs> going to school and right. and so it wasn't until when I was in college, uh, Turntable Lab opened their store in New York. Were you in college in New York? Yeah, I went to NYU. Yeah. So 99 to 2003. So I want to say that maybe like 2000, 2001, Turntable Lab opened? Yeah, something like that. And I would go there just to buy like cool magazines and, you know, markers and, and, and sort of like the tchotchkes that they sold there rather than like records. Yeah. And it was a good time for, for mix CDs too. I liked a lot of the weird, like kind of like post RJD2 DJ shadow sort of like groovy shit yeah, tapes. Yeah. And then when the first Holotronics mix came out and I was saying to myself like, oh man, this is party stuff and it's taking like 80 songs and Southern rap and weird club records. And so when there was a release party for that mixtape on Turntable Lab, that was kind of like the first like club night I went to when I was in college, and I was like, "Oh shit, this is okay. I get it now." That's you know? like, that was really the first like club thing you yeah, went to. Yeah, because I I I knew what DJing was. Like we had DJs at like you know the school dance and shit, <laughs> yeah. and you know you listen to Funkmaster Flex on the radio, but you don't necessarily think about like putting the you know these two records together the the, the the sort of classic like you know DJing is is taking two things to create a third thing you know right. and that third thing is a connection with the audience you know <laughs> <laughs> like like it, it, it was never really that until I went to that party and it was just all this other shit like oh man there's, there's girls and freaks and you know the, they got a Nintendo hooked up like right. the, like that kind of thing so that was very much my entryway into thinking about DJing as a thing I wanted to do. And then also at the same time, like I'd been doing a lot of like graphic design stuff. So I first befriended uh, Diplo and Low Budget from doing like flyers and shit for their parties, like mm. their website and stuff. Um, this girl Roxy uh, Cottontail uh, promoter in New York at the time was like, oh, look, I found you on the internet. You were talking about going to this Holotronics party. You do this other cool shit, you know, do some cool stuff for us. And yeah. it was super organic. There were no, there were no expectations. There were no stakes I was just, you know, 19, 20, whatever, and you wanted to do something fun. Yeah. And so that was my, that was my first um, kind of like foray into that. And then it just grew real rapidly. And I had a website that I was just putting like links and musings and flyers sure. and stuff on. A and, blog and, and, uh, Yeah, fully. Before that was even really like out there, you know, as a, as a term. Like I remember starting it on a, remember Tripod? Yes. Yeah, it was a, it wow. was a, it was a tripod site. Wow. And then I think like midway through you, Blogger came out with like the the software that allowed you to do the updates. Right. And so that kind of unbeknownst to me sort of had an audience to itself and so someone who read the site was like, "Oh, I work for this music magazine. Do you want to write stuff for us?" And I was Fader magazine. And so I started writing for them and they're like, "Oh, this is good. Like, do you want to come be like a junior editor here?" I was like, "Sure. Okay." <laughs> Cuz I I didn't really have any necessarily like, you know, these are the steps you take to be this. Well, I mean, did you even know what this you wanted to be at that time? Did you have I wanted to make stuff. It's the same shit I do now. It's like I knew I wanted to make music. I knew I wanted to do visual art. I knew I wanted to do like, you know, film and TV kind of things. I knew I wanted to write stuff. So you've always had And that. that's still, that's what I'm doing. I can't just pick one. It would be much easier and much more marketable yeah. <laughs> to pick one thing. <laughs> but I have to go where I'm excited by. And, and what was cool about that time was that all of these different, you know, kind of like side hustles fueled one another. You know, because I was starting to, I had just, I bought turntables. I was getting records, doing that. And that, you know, doing design and stuff for people, writing articles about things that I was you know, part of, you know, like all of these things were part of a, a creative world. And it was a fresh time for that, you know, because on one hand you have these sort of mashup y DJs, but then, you, you know, dance music, you know, the DFA stuff was happening, yeah. like bands were still halfway cool, right. you know, like there were, there were all these weird 12 inches where it's sort of like you could go to the store on any given, you know, week. And be like, oh, cool, here's Khalees Milkshake. This is 115 beats per minute. I can mix it with, you know, this Chick 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 song. And then I can mix it with, you know, this Rebby Jackson Centipede record that I got in the dollar right. bin. And they all kind of have, like, weird synthy elements. And there's a context there. And, uh, and, I, and I love that, that 
texture and at of, a, of mixing it all at together. At that time, I mean, I think that was almost a revolutionary act, just mixing those records together, you know? I think maybe in 2017, people, you mix a few different genres together in a mix and people aren't really Yeah, and I away. think it also, also now it got kind of corny, like sort of like that post, post-girl talk and, and like commercials, you know? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's sort of, it's, it's like a... Man, this fabric softener is yeah. lit. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's yeah. sort of like, isn't that crazy? They said a slang term, you know, for downy. <laughs> yeah. Well, I remember. I don't know why you saying that made me think of this, but I remember when Jay Z and Lincoln Park put out the the joint sort of Jay Z Lincoln Park mashup album. That was really just both of them kind of replaying their old songs together in a way. And that to me was like just the most lifeless kind of joyless uh, product. I, f- I feel you. I, I, I agree that the end results of that were less than ideal, but I do think that, you know, those guys were enthused by it. Sure. You know what I mean? And I think it's, yeah, I it's, don't think they were doing it to cash. Exactly. In. Exactly. Like it's, but it, but again, it, it, timing is everything. You know what I mean? Like if they did that a year or two earlier, it would have been a different sort of thing. It just right. was sort of like it, it came at the, um, you know, sort of the wrong end. But, you know, it's interesting kind of now having seen three or four of those cycles go through, you know? And yeah. you, in every scene, you see the moment of like, oh, cool, here's where it's all new and everybody's excited and, you know, we're all friends and da-da-da. And then, you know, somebody gets more popular than the other person. <laughs> it's sort of like, oh, no, now there's like, you know, politics right. involved. Now there's this, now there's that, and everybody's fucking grumpy. And, you know, and then, you know, to go even darker, it's like, oh, somebody, you know, got really strung out and, yeah. you know, is, is clearly ruining their life with their f- choices and behavior, you know. <laughs> and, and then uh, that reaches equilibrium and then some new shit starts up again. Yeah, and once you've seen that cycle a couple times, it does make you feel pretty old, man, because, you know, in each of these cycles, you know, I think staying in the music industry like we do, it keeps you young because you're constantly surrounded by young people doing young people stuff, but it, you also see them go through the same kinds of stereotypical young person yeah. trials and, and tribulations. I do, I do think that it's it's important to just kind of remember, like, what was the shit that got you excited in the first place? Exactly. And so for me, you know, that's that's important in in everything that I do because with with the Fool's Gold stuff, you know, we're ten years old, and it's and it's great to kind of have been able to navigate and and like survive. But at the same time, you know, if if you, you're not careful, it becomes like Groundhog Day. Right. You know? And for me, it was great to kind of remember shit that got me excited in the first place. Like, even before music, right? Before getting into this professionally or even as a fan, I loved comics. And so uh, my girlfriend got me uh, Comic-Con passes a couple years ago. And it was great because, like, I went there and there's this sort of, like, Proustian, you know, like like memory moment, and I was like, man, this is some shit that I love just to love it. It's not like I love it, and it's like, oh, cool, I'm gonna read this comic book and then learn to make it, and then, right. you know, it was just something that had no real like professional values, just some yeah. shit that I enjoyed, and and so that for me was like, oh shit, let me tap into this other stuff that I enjoyed. I was ripping all these old like VHS tapes, and. Um, finding like little movies and stuff that my friends used to make, not knowing anything, not having, you know, the technology at the time to really do anything with it. But we had a camera and an idea and just this attitude of like, we're going to do it. Nobody was going to give us permission. Nobody was going to say like, oh, we'll read this book or watch this tutorial or do this shit. Fuck that. <laughs> we're just going to pick up the camera and do it. And for me, that was very, it was very freeing to, to, to remember that sort of feeling. So I was like, fuck it. I have a camera. Let me like make music videos for people. Let me start this. Let me do this. Like, yeah. you know, same thing with like, you know, writing like scripts and stuff like that. You know, you, you can learn the structure that goes into it, but you can't learn ideas Right, you know what I mean. You, right. get, you just have to get it, get it in, and each time you do it, it's better than the next thing. And so, in in sort of exercising these other uh, creative muscles, when I come back to to music, I'm jazzed, I'm psyched, like yep. I have a new energy. I'm like, shit. Let me think about you know when I first started DJing, 
how did those songs make me feel? How can I make something that kind of like captures that feeling again? Yeah. Like, you know, I, I put out music very sporadically, mostly because of my schedule, just because I'm busy doing other shit. Yeah. But also because like I don't I don't really care to partake in like the sort of like rat race element of it. It's like when I have something that's done and it feels good, I'm going to put it out. And if it doesn't, whatever, like... You know, it it doesn't help me get gigs for sure. Yeah. But who cares? Like it, it, those kind of gigs are probably gigs I don't even want in the first place. Right. Like I'm nice. People who know me, you know, in in that setting, they're like, oh shit, Nick gets down. Like, oh great, cool. You know this. You want to partake in it? Hit me up. Yeah. You you you, you don't know this? That's cool. I have other <laughs> shit that I can do with my life. Like it's it's a very um. You know, I, I I I take the most positive spin on that attitude. It's not a fuck you attitude. It's just more like. You know what? This is it. You can take me as I am, or you don't have to. I'm not asking you to do anything. Right. You asked me. Yeah. You know, like you. You know how like you do like a weird gig, like a corporate gig, and oh, it's yeah. sort of like, oh, do, well, how, do this, do it. I played this weird, weird fucking party for a for for a unnamed footwear brand, and um, I love that brand. This, this 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 woman comes up to me and she goes, she goes, can you play? Can you play some hits? And I'm playing like Prince or something. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like like anything with 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 olds in the audience is always going to be that X factor. We're like, oh shit, what's yeah. this? What is she going to say? <laughs> and she goes, you know, like the music on Spotify. Wow. And I was like, what in the world? And I know people who have to navigate that sort of territory on a nightly basis. That's an incredible and for me, thing to say. It was just, but it was just it. It happened at this moment where I was like, damn, I I was not ready for like an existential crisis tonight like I really don't need to be doing this shit so like you finish the gig and you're like what the fuck you know Yeah. and so those kind of moments I, I try to do as much as I can to insulate myself from having to right. deal with that because like I, I like all kinds of different music I, I, I have interests and you know if, if there's an opportunity to exercise those interests and make people dance and make people happy I'm all for it but I'm not like jukebox man. Right. And I think it's, it's self care at the end of the day. Right. I mean, doing what we do being in this industry, it brings enough outside stressors and, and just weird shit along with it that if we're not enjoying ourselves and doing what we want to do, then I mean, why don't you go be a lawyer or something yeah. that pays better? You I know? encourage everybody. I feel like everybody should have like a, a, a real job. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. I yeah. feel like everybody should have a day job. I fucked up making my day job like a record label, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but, but I, but I, think that it's helpful for people to approach art with with innocence to to approach art almost like it's your hobby and one thing you said that i thought was interesting was you said you sort of fucked up making your day job running a record label and that made me wonder if there have been times in your daily record label grind over the last 10 years where you ran that risk of of you know the fun thing becoming the job thing and kind of losing the the enjoyment or the excitement, and if you've had those moments oh, and yeah. how you've well, dealt with it or brought it back, yeah, no, at literally every day, yeah, like which is not, I don't, I don't say that in a negative way. I say that in a, in in a, in a very realistic way, and the difference is your own mind state on how you approach those moments, because if you're stressed out or you're tired, somebody could say some shit to you, and it's just sort of like. You know, how dare you? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> right. it's just like, like, but that's a, that's a personal attitude thing. So I'm lucky that I'm wired to be pretty positive yeah. most of the time. So it's just like an extra bit of effort. But that extra bit of effort, it's, it takes from, from your daily well of effort. Right. You know what right. I mean? Yeah, so that yeah. like when, when you're, when you're going home and you're trying to like create something, or whatever, you're like, shit, we're fucking dry, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so I, I know you've talked about this plenty, and I'm sure with the 10-year anniversary, plenty more. But we should talk just quickly about, you know, you were working for the Fader. You started going to these kind of eclectic parties. You started DJing at some point in there. And at some point, not too long after, if I'm not mistaken, you met A-Track. How did that, what, what was the order of events there? Yeah, so... I'm I'm doing design stuff and writing stuff and DJing, and then um, adding magazine stuff into that, and then we got booked to together to do a party. 
I want to say the club was called Boulevard. Okay. It's definitely called something else now. It's like, you know, Sutra Lounge. Yeah, it's, it's all those one some, word name Yeah, clubs. some, some yeah. garbage. But uh, so we both did this party and we're like, oh, cool. We're, we're on a similar wavelength. That led to just, you know, he was on tour doing Kanye stuff. I was, you know, here and there doing magazine shit, wherever. And, and you're doing like the radio show on, on East Village Radio. And we would just encounter shit and send it to one another and, you know, give commentary on like, oh, you know, how come this song is their single? It sucks. And yeah, they could put out this one. Or well, why is this art terrible? Like, the, <laughs> you know, all those kind of things. And it coincided with, uh, with A-Track producing the early Kid Sister demos. Right. And, you know, they would shop those and no one was really the right fit for it because even like the sort of like the hip labels, you know, like vice or whomever, that was very much like the block party era, right? you know, like the sort of, you know, band with, with, you know, synthesizer era. Yeah. And so that was like the cool side. And then the hip hop side was like 50 cent, like legit 50 cent and and guys with Bluetooth earpieces and big ass jeans with this fucking embroidery on them, you know, (laughs) ironically, which is, which is back again. Suffice it to say there wasn't a home and, you know, A-Track who had previously put out kind of like, you know, more backpack type shit with his older brother in Canada, you know, had experience doing stuff was like, look, you know, why don't we do this together, pool our resources and go from there. And and it was such a fertile time where our own personal friendships fueled the first couple years of releases. You right. know, we were literally just putting out our friends' music. Yeah. And as the label grows, you expand that reach. So, you know, you you find somebody on MySpace, and and then now there's like an Italian dude sending you demos, and it's sort of like, oh shit, I'll, uh, I've never met you. I, I might never meet you, but we're part of this. Yeah. Thing together. It's interesting just to take it back for a quick second when you said that, you know, the the vices and the the hipster labels weren't fucking with the the hip hop side so much. I had never really thought about that, but do you think that that's like a racist thing or oh, was 100%. a racist thing oh, back I in mean, that time? I think the reality is is that like many interactions in society are racist yes, things, yes. you know? So that's just one, that's just, that's just like the, the, probably like the least problematic symptom, but for sure, you know? And It's and, just interesting to think about, you know, say the vices of the world or just the hipsters of the world at that time who are supposed to be sort of the, the more woke, although no one was saying woke at that time, uh, people, you know, the more forward thinking people, but still maybe there was those, those internal prejudices to think, I think it's, indie it, bands are exactly. cooler. Or, or just the this, this shit that you grew up with. If you grow sure, up yeah. listening to certain things and you know the, um, the, the shades of gray of like, you know, this, this stuff sounds like this, this stuff sounds like this, this is from California. This is, you know, atmosphere. Like, yeah. you know, there's, there's, <laughs> there's all different, um, you know, places to fit in. And, you know, if you don't, if you don't really grow up with that, if all you know is like the most mainstream or alternately like the most obscure, yeah, you know, something that kind of is, is a little column A, a little column B, you know, get, can get lost in the shuffle. Yeah. But you need people who, who kind of understand where you're coming from and care about it and, and, are, and are down to put the effort in. And if someone only like loosely cares about it or the thing they care about the most is sort of like, you know, I don't understand you, but you're popping and, uh. I'm I'm going to give you a very bad loan right now. You know, just <laughs> yeah. sign on, on this line. <laughs> well, so for those first few years, you guys are putting out music from your friends mostly, and mostly it's fairly successful, right? Like you guys had off the bat, you know, Kid Sister, Cool Kids, uh, Young Kid Cuddy thrown in the mix pretty early on there, uh, and a few more early ones I'm not thinking of, but. It seemed like right off the bat there was uh, an audience for what you were doing, and it kind of took off. That was my perception. Was that your experience? Yes, although I don't think it necessarily ever felt like, oh, shit, it's happening. It okay. was just more like, oh, this is great. These these things are happening. But And then it's only when they stop happening at that speed that you're like, oh, that was – that was unlikely, <laughs> you know. Um, but I, I feel like honestly, like our our batting average is consistent. Yeah. You know, like you have these things that are massive hits, but like most things, they they get out there. You know, and I think that what what qualifies as a hit has changed a lot over the years. Right. You know, now you know you have this sort of 
world of secret hits, you know, where there's some dude who you literally never heard of yesterday, and then you go on Spotify and you can see the receipts. You can see the yeah. millions of plays. Yeah. And it's just sort of like, wh- where is this shit well, coming from? Some people from? are even speculating now that Spotify is going to form their own label and start, uh, you know, just manufacturing these guys. I will say that the the reality is, is that no one needs a, 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 a big air quotes label. Yeah, I was going to ask pe- you about people's that. Needs, people's needs are, are different. They're, you know, to, 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 to use an overused term, they're bespoke. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like what works for one person at one stage of their career does not work for another person at another stage of their career. So with Fool's Gold, we've always been super transparent and upfront about that. You know, like we said, like, hey, this is what we do. These are the things that we want to do. If you're down with that, great, let's do it. If you're not down with that, you know, go with God, like, you know, find find something that works because there's nothing worse than being in a scenario where it's like, Hey, our great competitive advantage is, you know, these two experts with great taste and great ideas, but you don't want to take any of those ideas. You don't want to listen to them. You, you actively resist someone helping you make your stuff. Right. I like to call it the font argument. There are people who you will have to argue with about fonts. Some people that are just sort of like, okay, cool. This is fine. You know, whereas other people are like, no, this is the font that my boy put on this record. And it's like, well, <laughs> you know, do, do we have to do we have to do this? But it, it, you, you have to watch it because you don't want to like start off kind of like antagonistic. Right. You know what I mean? You have to you have to like sort of get your your, your Jedi mind trick on and be like, no, no, no. You want to change the color. of <laughs> <laughs> Well, and some artists are more self-directed than others, right? Sure. Like some might have a strong vision for that. And font. I feel like when people when people have their shit together, like, yes, great. And awesome. It's easy to good, tell. Good. Right? good. Keep yeah. keep doing what you're already doing. And then we can worry about like pushing it to playlists or whatever. But if something can be better, at least, at least be open to having the conversation. Right. You know, I, cause no one's ever been forced to do anything they don't want to do. I just want to make sure that you're listening because if you're not going to listen, it just makes me be like, well, why the fuck am I, <laughs> am I bothering? You know what I mean? Like, so, I mean, for our listeners, uh, some of whom are aspiring producers and, and DJs and musicians talk a little bit about what can a label like Fool's Gold do for you and what can't a label like Fool's Gold do for you? Because I think there's a perception when you're just starting off that, you know, Fool's Gold is a name I think that rings out through the dance music world. People associate it with, you know, a certain level of quality, a certain brand, a a history of hits and interesting artists. But there's a perception when you start off, and I was guilty of this when I was young, and I think a lot of people are, of just assuming that if you get this one label or if you get, you know, whatever it is, this one manager, whatever, that you, then you're set, no, no which one, is never no the one, case. No one taps you with a wand. I think that the reality is, is that there's no way to predict how anyone will react to, you know, a particular project. You know, you have to treat it like you're putting a bet on the table. And the more bets you can put on the table, the better your odds are. And, you know, for us, we've we've found that, you know, the the records that succeed, they're either so insane and undeniable that it doesn't matter, or you know, the reality is is that it's 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 really good and it's presented with care and it's polished to the to the the, the best you can get it. And then everybody's pulling their weight as far as getting it out there. You know, like the the labels on point. The artist is interacting with their fans in in like a, a genuine way. The um, manager is out there, you know, working for opportunities. The um, booking agent is out there working for opportunities, and everyone respects what the other is bringing to the table. Right. You know, that's th- when that happens. It's fantastic because even if the record doesn't work, the record after that does a little bit better, and the record after that does a little bit better, and then all of a sudden, like, oh shit. I have a career, like I'm an adult and I can do this stuff and everybody's excited because everybody's invested and they feel like they, you know, saw something from that. On the other hand, you have, you know, right now we're in the era of sort of like the young manager yeah, who just has this sort of attitude of, you know, just antagonizing everybody. And I can understand that from a sort of like self-preservation standpoint. Like you hear so many horror stories of people who got jerked. So, you know, if you don't have the experience, 
you're just you just want to protect your shit. Like that's relatable. Like I'm I'm an artist too. Like I want to protect my shit too. But you know, you you can't only do that. That can't be your your default gear. Right. You know? And so a lot of times you see artists who are sort of self-sabotaged by these kind of like inexperienced managers that just want to like, you know, put their fingerprints on shit and, you know, argue with you. And then when something does blow up, you know, this attitude of like, we did it all on our own. It's like, no, no one does anything all on their own. Like, it's always a team effort. And I'm not calling out any particular no, no. artist. Like I think that that th this is these experiences everyone has has seen to some degree or another. You have to be open-minded. You have to be tenacious. You have to be open-minded. You have to make sure that your art is on point. Cuz most people's art like it's it's fine. You know what I mean? Yeah. Most music that will come out this Friday is just fine. <laughs> Maybe there's a handful of it that is, you know, exceptional and it goes further. You know, honestly, maybe there's a handful of it that's terrible. And I'm almost like fascinated by that in the way that I'm fascinated by like, you know, the movie, The Snowman. You know what I mean? Where it's sort of like, this is zero on Rotten Tomatoes. I was like, oh, I got to check yeah, that out. You right, know what I mean? Because right. it's sort of like, you know, people work so hard just to be in the middle. Yeah. And so when something's like, you know, actively bad, it's sort of like, oh, maybe there's something, you know, maybe this is like revolutionary and yeah. we're just not <laughs> up on it. Well, I think that's to me, maybe the most valuable and hardest to teach nugget of advice is that you have to be able to step outside yourself and have perspective on your art right and, and that's hard to do especially as a young artist to really step back and say it's super really hard. how good is it and also too i think that you know the reality is is that for longevity you have to kill the ego completely yeah a hundred percent and it's something that is it is an ongoing process and everybody figures it out at their own pace. But talk to anybody and it is, it is the one thing that you have to do. But for certain moments, the ego might be all you have. And you have to push yourself to, to persevere when no one is fucking with you. Like, you know, imagine if Kanye listened to everybody who said stick to producing. Right. You know what I mean? Like, imagine if Titty Boy listened to everybody who was like, you're old, you're finished, you're washed up, and he never, you know, cocooned and came out as, as, <laughs> as two right. chains. Like, sometimes you need... You, you need to know when to listen to that voice that's that's just like, no, 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 I'm the greatest. Like, you know, these Philistines don't understand. <laughs> yeah. And you need to know when to tell that voice to shut the fuck up. Right. A lot of that's just 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 maturing and kind of like learning who you are. There's no guidebook to it. Otherwise, everybody would follow it. Yeah. But I do, I do think that, that as an artist, so much of the shit that you think about in your career and your professional life has little to do with the art itself. And so... If you're putting time and effort and energy into bettering your craft and you know and knowing that each project in some way shape or form is a step up from the last one whether it's the development of an idea or the adding of polish or or just feels stronger feels more like you you're winning and as long as you continue that broadcast there's a regular Thing that is you for people to tune into and that doesn't mean like releasing music like there's too much music yeah. <laughs> but maybe it's like maybe you know you're you're doing like you know a little video series or like you know the music is kind of you know this sort of steady level but people respect you on the production tips so you're giving like tutorials you, right. know, you have a podcast you know yeah, what I mean yeah. it's like, there's so many different ways to kind of keep yourself out there besides just putting music out but, but the music will always be there for you you know kind of like when it so the up or the down, yeah. you know, like the, there's, there's, there's waves in a career. No one has a steady rise and the people who do have a steady rise, they have an even steadier fall when, right. when that happens. Too. Right. Yeah. That's a good way of thinking about it. Well, how has your approach to, to your own music changed over time? You know, as you've matured and learned those lessons, do you do things differently musically these days? Are you less worried about fitting in that yeah, kind of stuff? Yeah, way, way less. And, and not that I ever was. I like to think about the, the music that I'm currently making, the music that I want to make, you know, just as, as having intention. Intention as art as opposed to like, a widget to be sold. Right. You know what I mean? I, thinking about stuff that I love to hear that I'm not hearing and being like, how can I put that out there? 
And it seems like at, with Fool's Gold, that's what you guys are putting out as well, right? Stuff you haven't heard before is stuff. Yeah, you try. Yeah. You know, I think it's it's less about the, the sound and more about the personalities. Right. Like finding people who are distinct personalities and saying like, man, you know what? You're special. You, you don't really fit in anywhere else. But here, you know, this is a big umbrella. Like, you know, it, it can it can work. Well, there. personality, I think, is the most important part. We've talked about, so you know, all this mediocre in the middle music. And how does that stand out? How do you, if you're a person who makes good music, but there's a lot of good music you out come, there. You come up with a catchphrase, uh, <laughs> you get you get facial tattoos. Well, yeah, now now we're back to the, the cynical stuff. But <laughs> uh, You know what? If, if, you're, if you're like a mellow person and you're not really like putting yourself out yeah. there like that, maybe there's a way that like your artwork is crazy. A hundred percent. You're the, you're like calm Brian, but your artwork is, is turn up Brian. Right. <laughs> you know, no, or, I mean, or, or I've has, run into that myself it has, for it's, sure. It's, it's some, something to sort of balance it out. Um, and I do think that people are afraid of making bold gestures because yep. if you swing and a miss, you know, bigger swing is a bigger miss. But the upside of that is, you know, you're really out there. I th- one thing that bums me out is seeing, you know, people get a little bit of success and then kind of like hedge their bets as far as like, oh, no, 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 I'm, I need to make songs. I need to work with a top line writer. Yeah. I need to do this and I need to do that. And then- You see that in the EDM world a lot. The best you get out of it, you're just sort of like, this is okay. Like, I don't mind this. As opposed to like when people are together in a room, like, man, you know what? I'm going to come up with a synthesizer sound that's going to make you fall out of your chair. Right. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to I'm gonna amuse you sitting next to me right here. We're going to come up with the goofiest hook. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. That's why I love the shit that, um, that uh, Dances puts out. Dances with white girls. Yes, because I... EDM vocalist. When the, when, the, when the hook comes out and it's just sort of like, take me to your leader. <laughs> like, I'm dying, but I'm, I'm just imagining him in the room just sort of like ripping a giant dab and then just sort of this comes out. Right. Like there, there's a sense of freedom to it that I find very appealing. And I understand that it's not for everybody, but I think that, you know, stuff that isn't for everybody means that for somebody, it's fucking super for them. Like it's extra for them. Right. As opposed to something that's kind of a little bit for everybody and then everybody is just sort of like, this is kind of a little bit for me and they don't give a shit. Well, and I would say, you know, the the dances with white girl vocal songs that have been coming out, I mean, they are not for everybody, but at the same time, they've become they're super, pretty popular. They're super catchy. And, well, and, they're catchy, but I'm saying they've also got a pretty big audience. Yeah. And I think this goes back to what we were talking about before. When you do make those bolder choices, those are the records people remember, the records people talk about. And in this case, the records that are making his career as a vocalist potentially viable and successful, you know, as opposed to if he had just done 10 EDM trap records in a row. Yeah, or like this is this is my, you know, tasteful tech house uh, excursion. <laughs> right. You know, I, I think that, that, that tastefulness can be a crutch. Tastefulness can 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 limit where things can go. I think it's a question of like where do you where do you sort of use a little bit of obnoxiousness as like your nitro? You right. know what I mean? You can't use it as gasoline. You know, like there's a reason why we're not all you know still party rocking in the house tonight. <laughs> but if you use it as a little bit of nitro, I gotta say just just to go back to uh, to, to to Red Foo for a second. Yeah, please. I was I was deep on his 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 wikipedia the other night just like kind of like getting upset at like grammatical errors on 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 the on the wiki and like citation errors on the wiki like thinking about like other people's wikipedia pages how they're like very well maintained sure. and thorough i was like the narrative arc of red foo's wikipedia entry needs pruning you know like i, I was like getting I was, <laughs> yeah like I was who's getting taking up. care of it anymore exactly but but here's here's an artist who's sold millions and millions of records at one point you know was playing the super bowl just absolutely massive and now it's sort of like, oh, remember that funny guy? Right. Maybe. The reason why I even was on his Wikipedia page was I was I, I encountered his episode of Tanked, the series about uh, celebrity fish tank installations. No clue that existed. There, there are definitely parallels to, to the EDM universe <laughs> uh, on, on, on Tanked. So there, there are these, um, these two guys who have a uh, business based in Las Vegas where they install um, – kind of like custom like basically Shaq is like yo my nickname is Shaq Diesel can you make me a fish tank 
that looks like a diesel truck. Yeah, Shaq, of course. <laughs> and then they, then they so it's then just like Pimp it. My Ride updated. Yeah, for fish. yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And so it gives you an insight into um, into the psyche of of a lot of these celebrities. I, I love Tank. That's a strong recommendation for a show I've never heard of. Uh, wow, I'm gonna go home and watch. There's all a Wyclef that. episode. Oh man, Wyclef's having a weird resurgence right now. I think he maybe I guess he's putting out a new album, which is probably why. I but. think he was somebody who was ahead of his time. And then he was of his time. Yes. You know what I mean? It's yes. like you're ahead of your time and it's sort of like you're the underdog. People root for you. They're like, man, why don't we respect the carnival as one of the greatest albums of the Jiggy era? Right. You know? And then you kind of stick around and you're less interesting. And you're like, oh, you know, Wyclef, uh, I, don't, I don't know about this one. Like you put out too much music. And then and you, you try to be the president. Of yes, Haiti. exactly. <laughs> Maybe make some you know interpersonal moves yeah. that you know are are, are, are in question. <laughs> but then you 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 go away, and now we can say like, man, it feels like we're in a bit of a of a clefissance, aren't we? You know, like, <laughs> did you see the poster for the um, the High Times Festival? No, that's happening. It's I I want to say it's like Cypress Hill and French Montana and Wyclef and Akon and like. A bunch of guys who like weed. I feel like those kinds of festivals and events are just never going to go out of style. No. Like everyone's always happy when a new one pops up. I feel like, you know, as as much as there's so many, like even like EDM festivals. Now, of course, yeah. The good ones, people will always be jazzed about. Like we, we were walking um, in the Halloween parade yesterday. There were all the, the street team was out for um, EDC. Like however many months it is before oh, EDC, God, yeah. and then some kind of like Armin Van Buren show, and like I love that like there will always be big ass Armin Van Buren shows. I love that um you know above and beyond can play Barclays, right? You know what I mean? It's just sort of like what the shit, and like there's you know you could just go there and there's a bunch of psyched Polish dudes, like yeah. <laughs> you know. I never thought about that, but I guess a Halloween parade is the perfect demographic perfect, for EDC. Perfect, perfect. Now that we've gone far afield, uh, I'm trying to think of how we can string this back to uh, to what you've got going on. But I, I guess maybe the, the question now is, with the, the EDM landscape being what it is, arguably on the decline in some areas, uh, it seems like Fool's Gold has pretty much fully moved on from the EDM wave, if you were ever on it. Do you think you were on it at one point? No, I mean, I think that we've released records that certainly worked in that world. Right. But it was never a sense of like, you know, we got to get a guy who's on, you know, the main stage. Right. You know, it was whatever. We, we've we always responded to individuals and then strong songs. And so either you're a strong individual whose songs have potential and we can help them reach an even bigger potential or you're a strong song and we can figure out how to kind of like tell a story around the personality. Like, you know, it was never sort of like, oh, we need to tick this um, genre box right. at any given time. Um, so, you know, we still release like harder dancey music. Of course. You know, I, I think there's always going to be a place for that. When people take notice, I mean, I was just uh, I was just with Hero Bust a couple days ago who makes, you know, the most craziest mechanized dubstep you know the, the yeah. hi-fi you know he's a, he's an incredible producer um and he was talking uh, we were both talking about the the housey stuff that you guys have been putting out and he you know he's in love with that kind of stuff and i think the the djs notice those records i think you D know? djs notice and it's like sometimes there's records that you really love that you might never get a chance to play out in your set there's just not really like a context for it if you look back on on this sort of 10 year catalog nothing really feels like corny or or played out yeah. you know like it's sort of there's there's still a a point of view right. i think to 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 the best records that still resonates when it seems like you and a track both obviously have strong points of view and strong opinions and my perception and you correct me if i'm wrong has been that you know a lot of what ends up being on fool's gold is the intersection of the two Venn diagrams of your tastes, right? The stuff that yeah, falls in the middle. I think so. I mean, I think that there, there's there's a lot of that. Sometimes it's just sort of like, you know what? The, you you like this guy. Let's just put it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, but everything has that sort of, um, you know, unity to it. Um, I know that, that, that for me, just the kind of stuff that I do musically, you know, 
I don't get booked to play harder dance stuff for the most part. Right. So it's almost like it's not even I'm I'm really I'm not really even thinking about that. Like it's it tends to be more on the hip hop side. And if I if I go into that zone, it might be more like on a mix or something. Sure. And even in the in the music that I'm making, it's less about having a uh, practical DJ value and just more about like this is music I enjoy making. Like I, I just produced the EP um, for this rap group from the Bronx, B I C. Yeah, I know that. Bitches is crazy. And, uh, I did not know that's what it's so. For. So that's that's gonna come out, and that's cool because it's like you know it can just be this is my sound, and then I can do the artwork, and then you know make videos for them, and it's sort of like I'm I'm fulfilling a bunch of different creative you know Joneses in the pursuit of 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 another artist's vision, right, you know right. what I mean? And that's great because it's sort of like oh cool, this isn't about me. It can be a, um, kind of about me, and, and you sure. know, more for them. And then when I make music of my own just kind of thinking about like what do I want this to be like I, I've been really digging a lot of 80s and new wave kind of stuff mm. just because it's not really out there in the in the public eye like that I mean it's out there in my apartment when MTV <laughs> classic is left on <laughs> right. but I'm just thinking about that like man you know a, a record like uh, like new order like bizarre love triangle like you listen to it and it's like man this this makes me feel something yeah you know what I mean and each little part and each little moment of the song, makes me feel something. It's sort of like, well, how do you how do you translate that in the music you're doing on your own? Like I don't want to necessarily make like 120 minute like, yeah, you know, 80s music. Peppy Manchester shit, but like in in the scope of, you know, a rap beat that I'm making, how do I capture a similar energy? And that's that's a fun challenge to be embarking upon. Yeah. Like like whatever the next like Nick thing that comes out is, I know it's going to be kind of more in that lane, like not necessarily like here's a bunch of new bangers, here's a bunch of bass rattling trunk slappers, you know, <laughs> but j- just more like here are some songs that that reflect my interests and, you know, the, the stuff that I'm excited about exploring. What do you think will be the next Nick thing? Is it going to be another album, singles? Do you have a concept for it? The, the weird thing is, is that someone will pay as much attention to this sort of 12 song project that you fucking you know slave over versus one song that comes out because it's friday you know so the the, i i personally love the album as like a bucket you know like this is (laughs) this is where this is what holds all of these things but in terms of capturing people's attention you have to you have to parse it out so figuring out a way to make that interesting you know as as i pursue more like kind of like film and 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 writing kind of things i want to figure out um almost like a like a sort of like short film framework that can be like okay cool let's just film this thing that can work as like individual narratives and little like instagram chunks yeah but we could also put it together and have like a you know seven minute thing to pitch to film festivals yeah. and it's all original and it's all kind of part of the thing so i definitely have, have i like a, that have that's a, like a, a mini yeah that's like a mini version of the visual album Concept. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, and you know you're you're limited by you're limited by um you know b- just budget and and stuff like that. But uh, like I was saying to you earlier, you know for me it's exciting to kind of take you know my my technical limitations or budgetary limitations or whatever and kind of turn that into you know an aesthetic yeah, approach. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's cool to see just on a personal note for for me to see you kind of be able to to go into all these different areas and execute these projects for yourself. Because over the years, uh, you and I mean, we've known each other a long time and we've had a similar conversation a bunch of times over the years where I would see you and we'd say, how are you doing? What are you up to? And for many years in a row, it would be some version of you saying, well, you know, the label's going great, but, and I think I'm finally at the point (laughs) where, you know, I can hand off enough work to really focus on what I'm doing personally. And and it seems like maybe now you really are at that point. Does it feel that way? Do you feel like... I mean, it's it's certainly what I tell myself. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But I mean, I think the the output shows it too. Yeah, no, no, no. They're all, they're all good problems to have. You know, I, I think that the reality is, is that not to be morbid about it, but your your days aren't promised to you. You know yeah. what I mean? Like, I don't want my ghost to be bummed. Like, fuck, I didn't finish this thing. <laughs> like, like, you have so many yeah. iPhone notes of good ideas. <laughs> Boo. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Back to the Halloween theme. Uh, but no, man, it, it makes me glad to see it. And, you know, from from my end too, 
I think I was trying to remember the first time we met and it might be might be when the first time I brought you out to play my monthly party in Chicago that we were talking about earlier where you slept on my couch. Yes, and ne- next to your uh, Hebrew Cohen Brothers poster. Yeah, you remember that. Wow. Yeah, I forgot about that. But, uh, you know, from that time, you know, we haven't hung out. It's not like we've ever lived in the same city, but we've intersected enough times and you've affected my life in all these these different but fairly significant ways. I was sort of putting it together as I was driving over here. I mean, the biggest way was that you tapped me to be Kid Sisters DJ. Yes. Um, which I literally changed the course of my life for several years. Took me around the world doing that gig. First major tours I had ever done. First, Was that your, your first hype man duties? Um, I had been hyping for rappers locally yes. in Chicago, yes. which is maybe why you even had the thought to tap me to do it. Um, but certainly on that level, professional, uh, DJ slash hype man and those skills too. I mean, learning to, to get on the mic and to be assertive that way, that made me a much better DJ. Yeah. Well, I, I remember, um, the, it was raining in Williamsburg for the pools gold party, Yes, which was part of, um, these promoters event called the pool parties, which used to be at a pool. But this one was not actually at a pool. They still kept calling it the pool parties. And uh, I remember you played either before the Kid Sister set or after the Kid Sister set. But it was all like feel good juke. Yes. You yes. know what I mean? Like, like I remember this very clearly. Like, uh, like, like juke remixes of like Stevie Wonder yeah, and, and shit. Joe Jackson and and, and the um the shit with the uh, was it a Jamiroquai sample? Like the, um, uh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. It was basically like the, it, it was pre, before pre people, footwork. Be- well, right, yeah. exactly. Before people really knew who DJ Rashad was, yes, I was playing DJ Rashad, yes. like soul sampling songs. Yeah. But, but it was, but it's, it's the kind of DJing where it's just sort of like, you know what, this is, you know, 5,000 people who are wet, like, <laughs> you know. Let me. It was an odd choice. Let me. Yeah. Let me. Let me do something for them. Yeah. Yeah. No. True. And, and I remember that gig very well. I remember uh, the first song of the Kid Sister set. It was still raining and it was still windy. The very first song blew my Serato records off the turntables, <laughs> which you never want. No. And then that was actually a comedy of errors that day, man, because I got the record back. And literally, this is not, I'm not exaggerating. The second song of the set, the wind started to pick up the record again. I saw it and I tried to like slap my hand down on the record so it wouldn't happen. I literally snapped the record in half. Oh boy. (laughs) It was one of those sets. But what I remember very clearly was we played, or I played, then Kid Sister with me played, and then Chromio closed it out. And when Chromio closed it out, it was one of those magical moments. I've, this happens very rarely, once in a couple of years, where the skies opened up yeah. at the basically the drop of their first song, whatever it was at that time. It was a big hit. And the skies just opened up, torrential downpour, and the entire crowd just started screaming in joy. Yeah. It was like the it's, happiest. It, it's super crazy. And I think that with all of this stuff, you know, th- th- those are the kind of things that you can't create but you you have to make yourself open to you know what i mean like like you 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 work to become like a vessel for that kind of shit to happen well and in other intersections there there were a few more you you did also tap me to dj for wale a couple times uh which did not change the course of my <laughs> life but, <laughs> but it's still a great story that i love to talk about um, cause he was a, a strange, unfriendly man, but, uh, it, it was good times, <laughs> <laughs> but no, you've always talked about, I mean, my, you know, you put out one of my early, uh, songs on geeks. Yeah. Geeks on, on fool's gold slash fool's gold clubhouse. And that song for a long time was the most, that was how people knew me. That was like my calling card for years. And I think I got bookings and and cloud and whatever awesome. else off of it. Yeah, and you know, there's just all these these little things. And I, when I was thinking about it on the way over, I don't think I had ever kind of listed it in my head before. But you know, I'm I'm grateful you're here, man. I'm grateful you guys are doing all this. Uh, 
making 10 years as a as a label and the kind saga of, continues well and and Wu-Tang. only growing larger right yeah it's, no it's good it's good i mean it you know it's the kind of thing where it's like you know you you realize that at a certain point it's sort of like well you you have to delegate stuff and all you can hope for is that people sort of take the spirit of what you've done and run with it yeah you know and then even if they don't do that maybe they're they have a different spirit that you're not even realizing could be better you you have to you know you you can't it's like you know you you can't um try and and micromanage that sort of thing you could try but it, <laughs> but it will it will not be successful well so what's what's coming up for fool's gold what are you excited about right now uh, either for fool's gold or for your your own music there's a bunch of stuff so so the the BIC stuff the the first video and single is going to come out next week um, and so that's cool because that's just fun. like, you know, we shot the video like partially in my apartment. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah. Like it was, it's just fun to kind of like have those sort of like arts and crafts moments. Well, and it sounds like that project in particular might be a return to the roots of doing fun music with your friends. Yeah, kind of where sure. you started off. For sure. My, my, my very, very high friends from the Bronx. <laughs> um, the uh, A-Track and Bauer are about to go on tour. And so they made these two kind of like quirky house records that are, that are coming out this month. There's a lot kind of on deck, like sort of going into next year, like sort of like newer, kind of like bigger signings. And, you know, as, as we as we beef up the infrastructure of the label, you start to kind of operate like, you know, a quote unquote real label. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes you 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 give away some of the sort of like uh, freewheeling, you know, hippy dippiness of, <laughs> of the old days. But what, but what you gain is awesome too. So, you know, being able to kind of like plan stuff a little bit further out has been great. And, you know, continuing to grow the um, – the merch side of what we do, we have the store in in Williamsburg, right, right across the street from Supreme. So there's always fucking kids walking <laughs> around, you know, do, doing doing. Got to get the, some good runoff from the Supreme store, though. For right? sure, for sure. And Complex Con this this coming weekend. So all these things are good. All these things are positive. I know that f- that for me though, this the stuff that's most fulfilling is you know the my own things. Yeah. So you know, try as I might, I'm never going to get someone else's. Thing to become my own thing so it's sort of like you have to you have to you have to refocus that energy and sort of you know put out the best things you can in that lane and then when you come back to the label like I always you know aspired to kind of like be almost like a like a like a like a funky uncle type role you know where you just kind of come and be like ah this is good keep doing what you're doing or like how come you're not in blah, blah, blah. you know like j- just just dropping jewels and uh being a, a a source of of storyteller keeper of the scrolls right you know like we we have 10 years of just digital fucking things <laughs> that need to be sorted you know for like I w- have you had wanna... time to reflect it, it, not I'm... really I, I mean i i feel like you know over, going into the 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 winter holidays i want to get the shit organized because a it'll allow us to put out sort of like a 10 year book mm. you know which which the the 10th year needs to end in order to kind of fully right. give the give the scope um and then also too it's it's like you know I want to have like a sort of you know best practices manual for everybody that's sort of coming in and sort of like not just saying this is what we do but this is why we do it which right. sometimes i think that you know you might take it for granted but if you're not articulating it to people how can you expect them to what to to be mind readers although i will say when you encounter a mind reader it's the greatest shit ever when you find <laughs> when you find somebody who like you don't have to over explain shit to and they can just run with it and sort of like you know what i don't even need to explain what my idea f- for it is because your ideas are great too right. i'd rather you just tell me your idea and then we're all happy because i didn't have to do anything and you're like it's mine <laughs> Well, uh, to wrap it up, I mean, is there anything we haven't covered? Anything you want to get out there? No, I think we we, we touched on a lot, man. This was a nice this was a nice little Frost Nixon, you know. Yeah, no, this was perfect. get down. <laughs> um, yeah, so 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 my stuff, the the BIC records, going to start rolling out this month, and that'll come out at the top of next year. I've been doing a bunch of um, music video projects and design stuff for for you know fool's gold things, but I, I I'm excited to kind of like broaden that and i've never really pushed it because i've been so busy with shit but right. now it's just sort of like no there's there's enough let's let's do this proper so i'm, I'm working on the kind of like you know portfolio site for that and the, my reel you know like <laughs> we're, we're in la i can say like you can check out my reel you definitely can. um and then uh I'm, I'm working on a bunch of non-music 
um, you know, kind of like script stuff, which is cool. Like a, a working on a outside of fool's gold yeah, purview. Yeah. But, but you know, that's, that's my attitude and my perspective on things. So whatever I do, it's going to be like, Oh, this is, this is like if fool's gold was a sitcom or like, you know, this is like if fool's gold, if it was an adult animated series, you right. know? So, so I'm, <laughs> I'm working on a, on a thing, um, uh, with my friend Mary, who's also a writer. And you know, that's been fun because it's just, you know, a different, kind of dynamic and it's like it's it's refreshing it's sort of like oh this is cool like the, you know you're 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 putting on a different um helmet a lot a lot of a lot of different pots to be watched yeah yeah but i think as we've talked about in this last hour that seems to be when you're the most happy and the most effective right because you're not fixating on any one thing it's sort of like like by default, you're you're focused to divide your attention up enough that you can you can't be neurotic about any one thing. Yeah. You have to parse out the neuroses and then it becomes healthy. <laughs> you're like, I'm giving you the, the most healthy amount of attention right now. Well, I mean, we talked about that you were like this even as a kid, right? Yeah. You know, kind of as a sponge taking everything in from all angles. How, do you know why you're like that? Have you ever tried to figure that out? No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean both. Both my parents are teachers, so I feel like when I was like little, little, you know, they they'd be reading to me and shit. But yeah. you know, I I'm just I'm just wired different, man. Like I'm I'm telling you about like ripping those old VHSs. Yeah. There's a good one of of me in kindergarten, and it's the kindergarten teacher like going around like asking everybody you know kindergarten type questions, and she gets to me and she's like, "So can you tell us your name?" And I just look at her dead in the eyes. I go, can I give you my alias? <laughs> and it's like, what fucking five-year-old does that shit? But here we are. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, uh, last last thought. Um, any advice for uh, the young producers out there, the young artists who are, are just trying to figure out, not even necessarily just musicians, but just people who are excited about what's happening in music and want to be involved, but maybe don't know the best way to get involved or the best way to start approaching people? Um, well, one is that, is that you learn by doing, you know, you can, you can sit at home and you can say, how do I do this? How do I do this? Or you can just jump in and you might not know what's up. You might fuck up. You might have, you know, it, it, it'll be difficult, but you're, but you're doing it. And then the next thing you do can get better than that. And then you can, you can speak to like, oh no, I've done two things. The, the first one kind of stuck, but the second one was pretty good. You know, like yeah, yeah. as opposed to someone who's sitting at home stewing about it and has done zero things. <laughs> right. You know, that is the that is the the biggest lesson. Learn in action, um, and then also, you know, I think that everyone should kind of think about putting as much of themselves into what they do as they can, because you see so many people who are trying to be other people and other things, and they're all kind of some degree of miserable. Right. Like figure out who you are and think about how can I express that via my art? How does my, you know, any style of music that excites you, like how is my rhythm song different than this other guy's? How's my, you know, funky tech house thing different than this right. other guy's? How is this record something that could only have been made by me? Right. And I think the fear there is that if you do something that's so you that it's not relatable to other people, that then you won't get those the views or you won't get, you know, whatever power that you would get if you did a successful thing. But I think maybe more than anything else, the theme of what we've been talking about is that doing that, making the bold choice, that is what's going to get you the long-term payoff. And those, the people who make those choices are the ones who are going to shape whatever happens yeah, next. Yeah, for sure. Sweet. <laughs> I you can that, do it, kids. Yeah, I think that's a pretty good way to tie it off. Man, Nick, thank you so much for sitting down with me, awesome. man. Awesome. No, thank you for coming in. Yeah, this is great <laughs> for coming in. <laughs> Seacrest out. Yeah, peace. All right, that's the show. Thanks, Nick, for having me over to A-Track's house. Shout out A-Track. Even though you weren't there, you have a beautiful home. 
Every time I get to talk to Nick, it's a pleasure, and this was no different. Don't forget, Nick produced the new single for BIC called Drippin' Sauce that is out right now. He also shot the video for it. The link to that and all of Nick's work is gonna be in the description of this episode. Shout out to Fool's Gold for 10 years. Incredible work. You can hit me up at backtobackpod at gmail.com or you can holler at me at Willie Joy on all social media. Hope you guys are having a good December. We're almost done, man. Just a couple more weeks left in 2017. Before we go, though, we got some really good shows coming up, so stay tuned. My name is Willie Joy. Have a good one. Peace. (laughs) 